Here preparations are being feverishly rushed to complete the erection of hangars and the levelling of the fields for the takeoff in the great London Melbourne Air Race on October the 20th. As a matter of fact, the aerodrome has to be ready a week earlier for the reception and accommodation of the machines and their pilots who are due to report on October the 13th. Milton Hall Aerodrome has been chosen for the takeoff on account of its size and will afterwards become a Royal Air Force station. It is evidence of the interest of the Air Ministry as a service aerodrome has been lent for the purposes of this spectacular contest, which was initiated and sponsored by a public-spirited Australian citizen, Sir Macpherson Robertson. I have been asked on many occasions if I would ventilate my... Sir Macpherson Robertson from his desk in Melbourne exhibits the prizes and talks about the motives which induced him to originate this project in connection with the Melbourne centenary celebration. Yet conceived. Well, there are many reasons but three might suffice. First, to improve and sustain aviation. Secondly, for stimulating the British aeronautical activities. And thirdly, for making Australia more broadly and practically air-minded. Australia's geographical position is a commercial problem and always has been from a distant standpoint but it's one that I believe that aviation can and will solve or considerably improve. Incidentally, there are two races, one known as the speed race, the other as the handicap race. Now, in the speed race, the first prize is 10,000 pounds and this gold cup, value 650 pounds. The second prize is 1,500 pounds. The third prize is 1,000 pounds. In the handicap race, the first prize is £2,000, the second prize £1,000. These prizes are sufficiently alluring to have tempted the best brains in aviation to compete, both from the plane builder's standpoint and from the point of the pilots. And I hope when the race is ended that I will have the pleasure of presenting this cup to the uh, winner, who may be a Britisher and a British plane. Now for a glance at the route which the competitors in these speed and handicap races will have to follow before any one of them can call himself the winner. Undoubtedly great risks will be taken in the speed section of the contest, for a short cut over desert or mountain may easily mean the difference between first and second place. The triangles on the map indicate checking points where landing is optional, and the fast machines will land as seldom as possible. The first compulsory stop is Baghdad, marked by a square, indicating that landing is compulsory. This first stage, being the most familiar, may well be the easiest. The second stage is to Allahabad, marked by another square and about 5,000 miles on the way. Here landing is again compulsory, and to reach it, arid deserts and difficult mountains have to be crossed. While the route skirts the country, which has always set difficulties in the way of foreign aviation, Persia. After Allahabad, the next control point is Singapore and the first part of this stage is of course over British India. But where the machines start to veer south to Singapore, they'll begin to fly over a vast jungle where there can be little hope of succor in the event of accidents. And they may run into squally weather so that the pilots will be relieved to sight Singapore. Fourth stage, Singapore to Darwin. The route follows the Dutch East Indies where interest in the race will probably be very acute for the Dutch machine is the favorite and Holland of course runs a regular air service from Amsterdam to Batavia. The last part of this stage is the dreaded hop across the Timor Sea to Darwin, 511 miles of shark-infested waters. Fifth stage, we are in Australia, but not home. Northern Australia is in itself a trackless desert territory, and the pilot who takes off first from Darwin may find someone else ahead of him before he lands in Charleville, New South Wales, the last control point. And if any two or more pilots arrive in Charleville about the same time, what a race it's going to be over the Southern Alps to Melbourne and Gloria, where Movie Tone will be on hand to greet the winner and send back first pictures of his arrival to the Movie Tone News Theatre. Now for some of the personalities entered for the race.
Prominent among Americans is the holder of the coast-to-coast -coast record, Colonel Roscoe Turner, who, landing after his most recent achievement, has something to say about his plans for the race. As you know, we are going over to London to participate in the McRobertson International Race from London to Australia. And this race, of course, is the longest race ever conceived in history. And it, there will be competitors from practically all nations. And it is our intention, naturally, to uphold the reputation of American aviation. And the planes in this race cannot be racing planes. They must be stock airplanes, and that is why we have selected this standard Boeing plane because of its dependability, its speed, and its durability. Of course, you know, there were 22 American entries in this race to begin with, but it has now dwindled down until there will be very few American planes in this race. And this race was conceived by Sir McPherson Robertson of Melbourne, Australia, and it will be the greatest race in history. And this is one time when weather will not get any consideration. When we start, we have to keep going. Colonel Roscoe Turner's co-pilot is Mr. Clyde Pangborn. Start from London at 6.30 in the morning of October the 20th. And if all goes well, we hope to bring back the bacon for the United States. They take off for a test flight in their two-engine standard Boeing plane. In parenthesis, it is regrettable that an accident to his machine has kept out of the race Mr. Wiley Post, here seen trying on his suit for a forthcoming attempt to fly into the stratosphere. Mr. Wiley Post, with his two round-the-world records, would surely have been one of the favourites for the speed trophy. There is an Irishman in the race, Colonel Fitzmaurice, who poses good-naturedly for movie turn in the rain, aboard the Bremen of Southampton. His Belanca machine, which he has named Irish Swoop, is a new one and was only tested just before he sailed from America, so that neither he nor his fellow pilot, Mr. Eric Watburner, know its capabilities. They have entered for both the speed and the handicap races. Colonel Fitzmaurice will be remembered as one of the three men to accomplish the first east-to-west crossing of the Atlantic in 1928. Our British pilots will be flying new machines too, and here is TWA Scott's de Havilland Comet, being christened for him by Mrs. Linton, wife of the Agent General for Victoria. I claim this bird the house. Well done. T.W.A. Scott is, of course, the former record holder for the Australia-England flight. Here are his remarks about the race. First, and we think that we have the right type of machine for this particular race. Obviously, the race must be set about by a good team and a good machine. And I'm very, very glad to have Tom Campbell Black with me as co-pilot on this race starting in three weeks' time. Jim Mollison and his wife will also be flying a de Havilland Comet, which at the time of printing is not yet completed. Much a matter of luck as anything else. Amy Mollison, as the hose one who made her name over this very route, has been getting practice by acting as a regular pilot on a cross-channel service. Yes, I'm doing this flying because I want to get a lot of practice in for this Australian race. You see, as a private pilot, well, I just choose my weather, but as a pilot on Hillman Airlines, just believe me, I've got to go no matter what it is. <laughs> The speed section of the contest will probably have most of the limelight, but it is not always the most spectacular achievements which have the greatest consequences. It may well be that the handicap race proves the most beneficial to aviation. In this connection, we cannot omit young Mr. Melrose, who arrived casually from Australia the other day to compete in the handicap race, having beaten the Australia-England flight record in his small post And I have coming over, it's far too strenuous. I shouldn't think it should stand for long as Sir Charles Pinkett Smith is leaving Australia in a few days if he has not already left. And that record will be broken properly, I should imagine. Mr. Melrose mentions Sir Charles Kingsford Smith. I'd just like to thank you for your kind wishes, Mr. Mayor, and assure you that while the spirit of Anzac is alive, Bill and I'll do our damnedest to put it in the front line. And what a disappointment it is that the greatest aviator in the world today has been frustrated in his intention to take part in a race in which, in a, as an Australian, he is peculiarly interested. Here is the delivery in Sydney of the machine which he had bought especially for the flight. 
Since this picture was taken, Smithy has had to withdraw. He set out for England hoping to create a new record, incidentally, but experienced trouble over Queensland and was compelled to return to Sydney. However, he will probably be heard of again. Pilot has asked Commander Perrin, the popular secretary of the Royal Aero Club, to sum up with some words about the flight. The early hours of Saturday, the 20th of October, at 6.30 a.m. to be exact, the greatest race in the history of aviation will be started from Milton Hall Aerodrome, Suffolk, England to Australia, a distance of 12,000 miles. I'm quite sure that even Sir Macpherson Robertson, when he offered the prizes of 15,000 pounds for these races, hardly realized the commotion he would stir up in aviation circles in nearly every country throughout the world. The work of organizing this race has been colossal and the largest proportion has necessarily fallen upon the Royal Aero Club of which I happen to be the unfortunate secretary. The club has, however, received the greatest possible assistance from all governments on the route. This has made our task much easier and we are now quite satisfied that the, five, that the arrangements at the five controls and 19 checking points are quite satisfactory. Everyone is naturally disappointed that several prominent aviators from all over the world have had to drop out at the last moment. But there is still a large entry fully representative of the greatest pilots of all nations. And so all seems set for the zero hour at Milton Hall in a few days' time. Comets, specially built for the Great Air Race to Melbourne, are on their way to Milton Hall, Suffolk, for the line-up preliminary to the start on the 20th. The first comet to arrive is being flown by O. Cathcart Jones and K.F.H. Waller. The second by C.W.A. Scott, a former record holder for the route, and T. Campbell Black. The third by Jim and Amy Morrison, both with countless aviation feats to their credit and providing a formidable combination. Other prominent competitors are flying a Clem Eagle, Flight Lieutenant Shaw. I wish everybody the best of luck. The Americans Wright and Polander with Baby Ruth, their monocoupe machine. A 33F is being flown by Flying Officer Davis and Lieutenant Commander Hill. <laughs> Young Mr. Melrose is piloting his Puss Moth, in which he recently broke the record from Australia. Squadron leader Stollett and KG Stollett are flying an airspeed courier. Here, and, we're and the airspeed AS-8 will be raced by Captain Neville Stack and Mr. Turner. Um. On the eve of the start of the great race to Melbourne, the Prince of Wales arrives in his plane at Milden Hall and walks round the aerodrome, meeting, among other competitors, Mr. C.W.A. Scott. The prince leaving one of the Dutch machines. The king and queen also visit Milton Hall to see the closing phase of the preparations for the race. In the grey light of dawn, all is set for the start at 6.30. Jim and Amy Morrison, flying their comet Black Magic, are the first to leave. The flag drops. They're off. The race has started. The remainder take off at 45 second intervals. Cascot Jones and Waller in another comet. The Dutch Panda, flown by Asjet and Geisendorfer, next. Another Dutch entry, Parmontier and Mull, in the KLM Douglas. The Jacqueline Cochrane in her Granville monoplane. A 
Fairy Fox, flown by Para and Hemsworth. The Miles Falcon is piloted by Brooke, who is taking a lady passenger. Mel Rose, who recently broke the record from Australia, is using the same postmark. Captain Stack and his airspeed Viceroy. And finally, the Starrett brothers in an airspeed courier. Great aerial achievements shot by movie turns. The Morrisons arrive in their comet Black Magic, first in the field at Karachi, having made wonderful time in the Melbourne Air Race and setting a record of 22 hours, 13 minutes to India. Wearing tropical kit, Jim and Amy stay three hours and then... off again. But at Allahabad, Scott and Black have taken the lead and are the first to land in their comet Grosvenor House. During their brief halt of an hour, Scott chats with officials. Then on to victory at Melbourne. The Morrisons are dogged by bad luck and Allahabad is destined to be the end of their endeavour, engine trouble putting them out of the race. The Dutch plane Panda S4, which crashed when landing, shows the damage which prevented further flight. An outstanding triumph of aviation, overshadowed... <laughs> The winner of the greatest air race, C.W.A. Scott, who with his co-pilot, Tom Campbell Black, is the first to reach Melbourne. They have pushed their D.H. Comet along at record-breaking speed over the 12,000-mile course. Hear what Scotty had to say about his chances just before leaving. We like the machine tremendously, and um, we hope a great deal for the machine, because we think it's capable of quite a lot. We haven't done very many tests on it yet, but we're very full of hope. And to think that it was only at 6.30 a.m. on Saturday the 20th that the British Airmen took off from Milton Hall for Melbourne. After over 9,000 miles of desperate battling, Darwin is sighted. The first glimpse of Australia that competitors get after their bullet-like flight halfway around the world. Now with the dreaded time or sea left behind, they only have one more port of call. And Scott and Blank carried all the way from Darwin on their starboard road engine only, can be seen landing their grand little comet at Charleville, where they are checked in by the official who marks them down number one. Scott now has a clear lead of 12 and a half hours from Pomontier, but is desperately tired and limps as he is escorted to the tent for food. Although worn and haggard, bulldog determination is seen on the faces of these heroes as they modestly tell Australia's listeners some of their experiences. Meanwhile, skilled mechanics are hurriedly attending to the damaged motor, hoping against hope that adjustments can be made to cure the trouble which was first noticed when Scott saw the oil pressure gauge drop when over the time or sea. Petrol pumps are forcing fuel into the tanks, and now all is ready for the last thrilling dash. As Scotty says, we'll get to Melbourne if we have to stagger the rest of the way on one engine.
Mr. Scott and Mr. Campbell Black. On behalf of the government of the state of Victoria and of the people of the state, I desire to extend to you the warmest of welcomes and the heartiest congratulations on your wonderful flight from England to Australia and to Melbourne. The whole civilised world has looked upon with admiration and with a degree of anxiety while you progressed across the face of the globe to reach Melbourne today. Mr McPherson Robertson at the present moment is shaking hands with the aviators is now about to speak. I am Mr Scott and Mr Black. You have made a most gallant and heroic effort to win this all-important international centenary air race. A flight of over 12,000 miles, the most severe and ever-changing climatic conditions. Speeding on high in peace like the dove, brave humans fly through the regions above. The space once reserved for the eagles alone is now filled with heroes, our own flesh and bones. It is appropriate that at Melbourne, now celebrating a great achievement over its first hundred years, you have achieved such a remarkable triumph for aviation should be receiving the first of the plaudits that you have so nobly merited from the whole civilized world. A very short time ago, I was sitting in the cockpit of an aeroplane flying towards an almost mythical place called Melbourne. <laughs> it had seemed to us that we started about five centuries ago and that Melbourne, as soon as we caught up one mile, we seeded two. So that made our journey very much longer than we had previously supposed. Particularly as it seemed remarkable that only two hours ago one was in such a mental state and now one's in a very different mental state, terribly embarrassed by your enthusiasm and yet very gracious to her indeed for being so kind and welcoming us this afternoon. Actually, quite true, I wouldn't know that I was here, only somebody gave me a paper and I see that my name is in it. And, <laughs> of course, as we all know, the press never lies. <laughs> so, I don't think I'd better say any more, because I've been talking too much to Campbell Black the last three days, and I got quite husky. I've been roaring at him. He hasn't been roaring quite so much, so I'm going to get him to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've never made a speech in my life, and even if I had one to make now, I'm so overwhelmed with the reception we've got that I could only say thank you. line at Flemington Racecourse at 200 miles an hour, the Melbourne Air Race winners land at Laverton. They are escorted back to Flemington for their welcome by Sir McPherson Robertson, sponsor of the race. Movie Turn presents the only sound film record of the replies by Scott and Black. appropriate that at Melbourne, now celebrating a great achievement over its first hundred years, you have achieved such a remarkable triumph for aviation, should be receiving the first of the plaudits that you have so nobly merited from the whole civilized world. A very short time ago, I was sitting in the cockpit of an aeroplane flying towards an almost mythical place called Melbourne. It had seemed to us that we started about five centuries ago, and that Melbourne as soon as we caught up one mile, we seeded two. So that made our journey very much longer than we had previously supposed. Particularly as it seemed remarkable that only two hours ago, one was in such a mental state, and now one's in a very different mental state, terribly embarrassed by our enthusiasm, and yet very gracious to her indeed for being so kind and welcoming us this afternoon. 
That's not true. I wouldn't know that I was here. Only somebody gave me a paper and I see that my name is in it. And, uh, of course, as we all know, the press never lies. So, I don't think I'd better say any more, because I've been talking too much to Campbell Black the last three days. I got quite husky. I've been roaring at him. He hasn't been roaring quite so much, so I'm going to get him to talk. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've never made a speech in my life, and even if I had one to make now, I'm so overwhelmed with the reception we've got that I could only say thank you. <laughs> After Scott and Black come the runners-up, the Dutchman, Mull, and Parmentier, who said a word about the flight. We had a very good trip all the way, except the last night, when we were, uh, I should say, pinched by thunderstorms. I couldn't reach Melbourne. But anyhow, we arrived here a little later. Third in the race come the Americans Roscoe Turner and Clyde Pangborn and their wireless operator. They too face the microphone on arrival. They're tired but cheerful. We've had a great flight, and I'll let Mr. Pangborn and Mr. Nichols speak for themselves as what they think about it, but I don't want to make another one right away. I thank you. <laughs> here and there, we've got a glass of beer. And Did you say? <laughs> yes, I say. <laughs> It's been a long uh, trip, very tiresome. I'm glad it's over. And I don't think I'd like to make another one right away. And now Melbourne accords the heroes of the air race a triumphal procession through the city. A hundred thousand people are in the streets to cheer the aviators whose feats have thrilled the world. First the winners, Scott and Black. A fair admirer breaks through and shakes Scotty by the hand. Parmonti and Mull also get an enthusiastic reception from the crowd. Then the Americans, Turner and Pangborn, to whom the scene must be reminiscent of New York. McGregor and Walker, the New Zealanders. Last comes Melrose, the young Australian. His mother can just be seen, but the police on the car prevent a view of the aviator himself. A wonderful day for Melbourne, founded only a hundred years ago.